Hi, everyone. This is Jason Burak of Wall Street for Main Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street for Main Street podcast interview. Today's special guest is a first time guest, but I've been reading his Sprott Money articles for a while now. There's some really good insights in there. I've been following him on Twitter, too. He's got a really nice Twitter feed with some really interesting stock charts and analysis there. He's a CEO and co-founder of GlobalProTraders.com. He's a chartered financial analyst holder, former uh, foreign exchange trader or FX trader. He was a are you still a professional money manager or was a professional money manager? Uh, I was a professional money manager, no longer. Okay, okay. Making sure we get accurate here. Was a professional money manager for bonds, equities, and commodities. Multinational executive and treasurer. He worked He worked in Silicon Valley for a while. I'm surprised to learn that. Really cool. And also, like I mentioned before, he's a Sprott Money writer and contributor. You can find his very interesting articles there. David Brady, thank you for joining me. Thanks for having me, Jason. Now, David, let's talk about the stock market. So you think that there's a rising risk in the fall of a stock market crash. Why do you think that? Okay, so let me uh, just step back for a second, Jason, and mention my process. I use what I call a holistic process, which is I don't rely on one tool like technicals or uh, sentiment or positioning or Elliott Wave Theory or fundamentals. I use them all. I don't know why people confine themselves to one tool. I use them all. And the beauty of that approach is you can use what we call in investment circles the mosaic theory, which is you take pieces of a puzzle and you put them together. Well, the pieces of the puzzle that point to a crash in the fall, and I've said this since February, uh, are pretty big. And uh, when you put them all together, it makes a very strong case for uh, a crash either in September or October this year. I can go through each one of those, but I just want to lay that out. Do you want me to go through each one of them? Sure, sure. Very briefly. But, you know, from uh, there was one other technical analysis guy, very famous, not sure if you've read his work, but Ralph Alcampora, and he liked combining fundamentals and technicals, and he called it fusion analysis. So is that similar mosaic analysis? Yeah, it's similar, but it's still just technicals and fundamentals. I use all of the above, which is, fun, I call it FIPEST, fundamentals, intermarket analysis, positioning, Elliott Wave Theory, sentiment, and technicals. And you can throw in the mark indicators and, of course, manipulation in the marketplace as well. So uh, FIPEST XM is what I call it. And, you know, I'll use even mainstream media signals. Typically, when CNBC says, some, CNBC says something like buy gold, I sell it. Um, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so or Barron's or the Wall Street Journal, etc. But, um, yeah, I, I look at them all. And the reason I do that is... When they all point in the same direction, which they did in gold in December 2015, you can feel pretty confident that your view is correct. So I, you know, people sometimes call me a gold bug, and now I'm writing for Sprott Money. But uh, I didn't buy gold for the first time until the second half of 2015 because all of the indicators that I look at were pointing to a major bottom in gold, and uh, it was. Uh, an incredible opportunity from a long-term perspective. It wasn't a short-term trade. I bought uh, gold and, and silver since, but uh, with a view to the long term, each of my indicators said, this is the bottom. And you know, I'm seeing similar indicators now telling me that the stock market, at least in the near term, uh, is in for trouble, but uh, a crash. But that crash will provide a great buying opportunity because I do believe it will be followed by a blow off top. Uh, over the next two years when the Fed and the other global central banks of the world respond. But we can get into that uh, after we discuss why I uh, expect a crash. Yeah, so you, you actually asked my question for me. Why do you expect, <laughs> what, 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 why do you expect a crash then? What, what fundamental reasons or, or big global macroeconomic themes do you think are causing a potential crash then? Okay, so I'll go through. This could take up the entire interview. I could be talking to myself, but here I begin. Um, first of all, negative global liquidity. The If anybody takes out a chart of the stock market relative to the uh, combined balance sheets of the Federal Reserve, the European Central Bank, and the Bank of Japan, and you can throw in the Bank of England and uh, Swiss National Bank if you so desire, you will see that basically the uh, rise in those balance sheets uh, on a cumulative basis matches that of the S&P 500. That is not coincidence. That's what I call the punch bowl. That money, that QE, found its way into the stock market. That's uh, you know, uh, the basis of a whole other discussion. But I, I believe that's the case. And now that punch bowl is being removed. Um, the Federal Reserve is pursuing uh, interest rate hikes and balance sheet reduction. 
on top of uh, the European Central Bank tapering their QE, which is expected to end at the end of the year. Uh, the Bank of Japan is stealth tapering their QE as well. Swiss National Bank is talking about it also. Uh, in a nutshell, uh, based on information, you know, all the banks are talking about this, but I like Ron Steufler's work. We expect at the latest um, global net liquidity to turn negative in Q1 of this uh, next year. Um, markets tend to be forward looking, so I expect them to anticipate that, but work by other banks say it's actually going to be even sooner than that. And if you look at Nordea Bank's June note, they believe it's already turning negative. So uh, that's one aspect. You've got negative global liquidity, uh, either Q4 or Q1 uh, of 2019, and that has been the basis for this entire stock market rally since 2009, in my opinion. Uh, then you've got Lee Adler at the Wall Street Examiner talking about uh, QT. And you know, this is the uh, Fed tightening. But he points out that the uh, balance sheet reduction program, which the Fed has undergone since October of last year, increases to 50 billion per month in October. And that's the maximum ab amount. Well, that's a 600 billion run rate per annum. And that means 150 billion in Q4. This is at the same time that budget deficits are skyrocketing in the US. Uh, you're already getting an increase of uh, U.S. Treasury issuance of 100 billion uh, per month over and above what they have to uh, uh, replace in terms of maturities. So that's 150 billion in terms of extra demand that you need to come up with. Well, last I checked, foreign demand is actually waning for U.S. Treasuries. So this is going to put a lot of pressure on the bond market. And uh, quite frankly, I don't think the domestic institutions are going to be able to mop it all up and the Fed is going to want to be able to return to quantitative easing in order to be able to buy that debt again. Because, uh, And I'll get into this later based on work that Luke Roman and a fellow Irishman that Louis Curran did uh, regarding Fed priorities. But the Fed cannot allow bond yields to go materially higher because the 10-year uh, yield is used as the risk-free rate in you know, cash flow models, discount valuations for nearly every risk asset. And if the 10-year yield skyrockets, it'll blow up risk assets, not to mention the US budget deficit because of the debt, you're gonna be charged more interest on, on that debt. Uh, it, it'll, you know, the perception of, insol of solvency will soon uh, dissipate or you know, become uh, less uh, valid, if you will. So. There's that QT issue coming in October. Then you've got the trade war, which is currently ongoing, as you can see, uh, and it's getting worse. Uh, the latest was on August um, August 1st, I believe, when the U.S. Trade uh, Department came out and said, uh, having been directed by Trump, that they would consider adding 25% tariffs on uh, 200 billion of Chinese exports. Uh, they, used, they were considering 10%, but they ratcheted it up to 25%. And that was in response to uh, Chinese uh, retaliatory measures for previous tariffs. Well, that's 40% of Chinese exports. And the Chinese have devalued the yuan in response, in my opinion, um, since Trump uh, first floated the idea of tariffs. And it's no surprise that the peak in gold was coincides to the day to the bottom in dollar yen. Uh, it was April 11, uh, gold peaked at 13.69 in dollar terms, and dollar uh, won uh, uh, troughed at 6.2680, I believe. And since then, the dollar won has been devalued close to 10%, which matches the tariffs on Chinese exports. The, those, that 25% on the 200 billion, which is 40% of Chinese exports, is due to go into effect around uh, uh, earliest September 5th. That's the date that the US Trade Department provided, but it could be a little later. It could slip into the, further into the month. But how are the Chinese going to respond to that? Um, what, a maxi devaluation of the yuan? I mean, that would bring down world markets. If 3% if devaluation can bring down the stock market, the S&P from 2100 to 1800 back in August of 2015. What would a 10, 15% overnight devaluation of the yuan by the Chinese do to the world markets? And given what's happening already in emerging markets, which I'll get into next, uh, I, I think that would cause the crash in and of itself, not to mention the other factors I've already remembered, mentioned, negative global liquidity and rising QT. Then you get into dollar strength. The dollar has been taking off and 
uh, one of the reasons for that is a stronger dollar helps keep bond yields uh, low, but I'll come back to that. But one of the negative effects of that, as we've seen, is uh, what's been happening to emerging markets, which have a ton of dollar-denominated debt. So they're running into trouble, and you've seen it in Argentina, uh, to some extent in Brazil, but most lately you've seen it in uh, Turkey uh, today, for example. Uh, if the dollar continues to strengthen, that's going to become pervasive. And I think, uh, I agree with Jim Rickards on this, there's a little thing called contagion, and we've seen it before, that we're living in an interconnected world. People who think, you know, this is going to be confined to emerging markets are deluding themselves because the the people on the hook for these loans to these emerging markets are banks, and some of those are U.S. banks, whether directly or indirectly, and it's going to hit the U.S. So that's point number four. I would also add, if you look at any of the Fed speeches over the past few months, it is clear to me, and this is all, you just go onto the Fed site and download them or just do a Google on each of the speeches over the past few months. Nearly every member has gone, been at pains to point out that, uh, or to you know, put the blame on a possible downturn in the economy and downturn in markets on Trump and his policies. And not just his trade policy, his foreign policy, his fiscal policy, his immigration policy, and his regulatory policy. And uh, we talked about the tariffs, and that's uh, obviously a risk. Uh, foreign policy, there was the concerns about uh, North Korea and Iran, uh, neither of which have fully gone away, especially the latter. Um, on the fiscal side, the comment was made that, okay, we've cut taxes and we may you know, increase spending on an infra infrastructure, but if we do, we don't have any dry powder from a fiscal perspective if we run into another crisis. Again, that means if you get into a crisis, oh, Trump spent all of our ammunition and now we have nothing left to fight it from a fiscal perspective, the, the crisis that is. And then you get to uh, even immigration, uh, blaming the lack of the increasing wages uh, in the U.S., on low-cost labor. With less uh, Mexicans and other immigrants coming into the country, we'll have higher wage costs. Uh, well, that causes inflation, and that means we'll have higher rate, uh, we could potentially have stagflation, and that'll be Trump's uh, immigration policy that is a fault. And lastly, regulatory. A foreign committee, uh, a Fed committee recently of three people, including Leo Brainerd, uh, voted two to one, uh, I think it was led by Quarles, um, two to one, to relax some of the requirements of Dodd-Frank, uh, specif specifically with regard to so the sovereign, uh, sorry, uh, sovereign, the uh, proprietary trading by the banks. And uh, you can see how that will be used or could be used in the future. If the banks get into trouble again in a crisis, they can point the finger at this and say, look, you relax regulations associated with Dodd-Frank, and that was Trump. And it was interesting that Leo Brainerd was the one dissenting voice who said that this, uh, you know, basically, and I'm paraphrasing, doesn't make sense given the times that we're in. Uh, assets are clearly overvalued, excessive valuations, etc. They're basically looking at each of Trump's policies and saying, like, each one of these could contribute to a crisis or make it more difficult to deal with a crisis should one arise. And I ask myself, why are they doing this? Every single one of them is reading from a playbook. Well, you wouldn't be saying this unless you expected a crisis. And obviously, you want to put the blame on Trump rather than on Fed policies for the past three decades since Greenspan and that in QE since 2009. And since October of last year, at least on the balance sheet reduction front, QT. So, which I believe is the real reason why markets will get into trouble, is uh, the rate hikes and quantitative tightening and negative global liquidity. But now you have uh, an easy person to blame it on, and, got be and there are pains to build a case for why Trump would be at fault for this coming crash. So, that's another contributing factor. And lastly, two things. We had a great Q2 in terms of GDP numbers. Well... Some of it was padded by soybean sales and inventories. The likelihood is that in Q3, those numbers will be uh, a lot lower. And, you know, when, you, uh, when you're concerned about negative global liquidity, uh, cutting the balance sheet uh, $150 billion a month when the balance sheet, when the budget deficit is increasing, uh, treasury issues by $300 billion a quarter, 
and then you've got a trade war and you've got dollar strength creating contagion problems. You, the last thing you need is problems on the home front with regard to the economy and negative economic data raising concerns about a recession. Because at the end of the day, it all comes down to perception of the market because uh, it's human beings that are actually buying and selling stocks. And my final point is, uh, I watched the COT report data uh, with regard to positioning. And one thing jumped out at me in, in recent weeks. Uh, look at the commercials, the so-called smart money, and what they're doing specifically in U.S. Treasury bonds and in uh, the yen. If you look at uh, the Treasury bond positioning of the commercials in the 10-year and the 30-year, they are at record levels, by far and away higher than the previous record. And the, they're not at record levels in the yen, but they're building those. Well, why, you would only build record levels of bonds, a uh, long bond position, if you expected bond yields to fall. Because if bond prices go up, bond yields go down. And the same with the yen. You wouldn't be building a long position in the yen unless as you expected the yen to rise. Well, what could cause bond yields to fall dramatically and the yen to rise? Well, a, a crisis, a, a stock market crash. So when you take each of those factors, and those are just the fundamentals uh, that I'm seeing, fundamental pieces. When you teach, take each of those factors and you put them together, it makes a strong case for a, a crash sometime later this year. Now, the reason why I say with regard to timing the fall, well, it was interesting to me that the midterms are coming up in November, and I do think that you know China in the trade war is uh, very aware of this, and they've said this publicly on their news outlets, that uh, they, they're they playing a game of chicken with the U.S. The U.S. is hoping that you know uh, the economic hardship that China goes through will bring them to the table and agree to U.S. demands. The Chinese believe that uh, their response or the actions of the U.S., the tariffs will impact the U.S. economy to such a negative degree or that the uh, there will be a financial crisis in the U.S., code for a stock market crash, and that will bring a soften the U.S. stance on trade and therefore enable an agreement. Um, so there's that from number one, but the other thing is, and that's with respect, especially ahead of the midterms, because the last thing President Trump wants ahead of the midterms in the GOP is a stock market crash. He said his performance is based on that. The other fact is, uh, Paul Ryan uh, resigned from politics I mean, he's still the speaker, but he, he resigned from politics, uh, gave his notice in April. He didn't give a really good reason for why, in my opinion. Perhaps he sees what's coming and he has decided that he doesn't want to go down with the ship. And so he wants to get out before the midterms come around. So if a stock market crash does come because of all the fundamental reasons I've, I've mentioned, uh, it may be a rocky period for the GOP in the midterm elections come November. And so those are the fundamentals. That's with regard to timing. I could go into the technicals uh, and sentiment, etc. But I'm going to leave it there and open it up to you, Jason, with any uh, comments you want to make at this point. That's some very interesting analysis. That's I think I think our listeners are going to have to listen to that a couple times because all the different things you went through with the global. That's a really good summary in about 15 minutes or so, give or take, of the global macro picture. And what's been going on. So our listeners want to know the date that we're recording this is Friday, August 10th, 2018. The dollar index, you said the dollar is rising. I'll add my two cents in here. The dollar index is at 96.3. So it's been on a big, big tear since around March or so. And yes, the dollar is doing well against the G7 currencies that are in the dollar index like the yen and the euro, but it's also doing really well against emerging market currencies. So do you think we're at a, a dollar strength right now that's gonna that could potentially do a lot more damage? Or do you, do you think that the dollar would have to go higher before it does like even more pain points? Well, I think it's already happening, Jason. I mean, you can see it it's, uh, with Argentina. Turkey is the latest victim today. Um, but to the extent that the dollar continues higher, and it may very well do so, but I, I do not agree that with a lot of dollar bulls that you're going to see a hundred and twenty dollar index, for example. Oh, it would crash um, things by then. I think I think I think there would be intervention by like President Trump, the Treasury Secretary. I think there would be like a Plaza Accord type agreement. I don't think they'd allow a hundred and twenty dollar on the dollar index as well. I think yeah. there would be intervention. 
Yeah, exactly. I, 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 you know, my target uh, since you know the we went turned uh, we bottomed at eighty eight and we reached ninety again was uh, that for a peak is somewhere in the middle of uh, ninety six to ninety nine. So you could get to ninety nine, but I don't see it getting above a hundred. Now that's just my personal opinion. I could be wrong. But that will inflict enough pain that you're already seeing on the emerging markets that it will force some kind of reaction that you just po- you just spoken to, either a plaza accord of some sort, um, Trump gets his wish and uh, gets the Treasury to start selling dollars, or the Fed backs off. Um, but the, the emerging markets are already suffering. If the dollar continues to strengthen, you've got a trade war going on. If the U.S. implements those 25% tariffs on 200 billion of Chinese exports on September 5th, um, the Chinese have already devalued their yuan by close to 10%. What on earth are they going to do in response? They can't apply the same kind of tariffs on U.S. imports because they're only a third of Chinese exports. So they have to resort to other measures. Now, yeah, they've made mention of talking, uh, made mention of. Um, uh, some pushback on Apple and Mercedes and other uh, corporations work, you know, uh, selling and manufacturing in China. But again, that's going to have limited impact, and it won't be a decisive blow or a punchback, if you will, uh, to the U.S. for implementing 25% tariffs on 200 billion of goods. So, what could the Chinese do? Uh, well, what if they devalue overnight the Chinese yuan by 10%? I mean, everybody thinks, uh, well, not everybody, but a lot of people think that's ridiculous. One of them is not uh, Jim Rickards. He's one of the first that mentioned it, and I'm seeing more people talk about it. I mean, that would bring the Fed uh, back to the table in terms of uh, QT and uh, hiking rates. I think they would pause at that point. And I've always said, and you've, you've probably seen this in my spot articles, Jason, the moment that we see the Fed pause or begin to reverse policy is when the dollar falls and most notably gold and silver take off. And uh, there are any number of factors that could cause this. But we've talked about dollar strength causing contagion. That could be one. And the another one could be a Chinese response to the US in the trade war if those tariffs are implemented in on September 5th. But Trump has already mentioned a, m- a little over a month ago that he could put 25% on all of Chinese exports, 500 billion. I, I mean, I can only imagine what the Chinese would do in response to that. So there are a number of factors out there that could uh, force the Fed to reverse course. And once the Fed re- uh, re- reverses course, I believe it's game over for the dollar at that point. Well, I, I, so I think I would summarize in your views of the last couple of minutes, and I, I think I, I'm on this page as well, that in the short term, I'm dollar bullish because it seems that the dollar is rallying and that a lot of people are long the dollar and that the emerging markets are in trouble. But in the long term, I'm dollar bearish. So, you know, yeah, is, I'll put it. Sorry, sorry Jason. I just want to say I, I agree with you put it well. Uh, I, I, I would put it this way. I also believe that the dollar will get stronger. But as I've said in tweets on Twitter several times, uh, dollar strength accelerates its own demise. And the reason for that is the stronger the dollar gets, the more pressure it puts on the rest of the world. And ultimately, something's going to break. And in, and that, in my opinion, is going to be the US, either the US economy or the US stock market. I think the U.S. economy is doing okay, um, but I think it's going to be the U.S. stock market that's going to feel the brunt of it, and probably the banks first and foremost. So, yes, short-term bullish, but when you say long-term, I'm predicting this crash, I forecast, and I could be wrong, of course, but I'm predicting this crash in the fall, September, October, pre-midterms, and after the Fed, if there is a crash, the Fed will reverse course relatively quickly because stocks are immensely important to federal tax receipts, and uh, the Fed cannot allow a persistent sell-off in U.S. stocks because you know, questions about the solvency of the U.S. government would come into play at that point because federal tax receipts would drop. You've got spending going through the roof. You've got bond yields higher. Um, the Fed's going to reverse course pretty soon after that, and that's when the dollar will fall. So it could be as soon as December or Q1. And President Trump and his Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin have been on the record saying they don't want a strong dollar. So they don't want the dollar to fall too quickly. They don't want it to collapse, but they also don't want the dollar to strengthen 
too much either. So they want it to be managed. I've said this. They want it to be managed, stay in like a trading range, but over the long term, gradually devalued to be a controlled. Jim Rickards has talked about this too as well. But what do you, so you have a very interesting, you've written articles about this for Sprott Money about the RMB's effect on gold. So you said in your most recent article for Sprott Money a couple days ago that there's no bottom in gold until the trade war ends. And in the previous article before that, one of your previous articles before that was USD CNY, the mirror image of gold. So you think then uh, you were we were talking before we started recording and you were laying out your argument for this, your thesis. And it sounds like you think that the Chinese government has open market operations managing the gold price in RMB. Do I have that correct for, for your thesis of this? Uh, yes, you do. Um, and it, it's basically you know, looking at the chart of uh, the gold in uh, Chinese yuan terms. If you look back since the Chinese yuan was added to the SDR, you will see that uh, the, the range of gold in yuan terms have fallen to between 8200 and uh, 8360. And uh, it was much, much wider prior to that. It's fallen to that level now. And uh, the reason why, and, and so just take out a chart and look at it, it speaks for itself. Uh, if you, um, how could they do this? Well, they can obviously control the yuan. Uh, aspect of things. The issue that the, they have is with regard to gold, and that's the pushback I get from a lot of people. Well, they can't control the gold price. Well, yes, they can. They could use the futures market in the COMEX uh, to do that if they if they choose to do so. I, I'm not. Uh, we can get into a debate on the mechanics of how they make this happen, but you know, it, the, as we say in Ireland, the proof is in the pudding. Just look at the chart, and then. Explain to me how, go, if, if you look at an equation for uh, gold and dollar terms, uh, being a former FX trader, any uh, exchange rate can be broken down into two other exchange rates. So gold in uh, dollar terms is equal to gold in yuan terms divided by dollar yuan. And if the gold in yuan terms is fixed in a range of 8200 to 8360, which I believe it is today, then dollar yen is inversely correlated or pegged to gold and dollar terms. Put it this simply, if dollar yuan goes up, gold goes down. Well, what's happened in, uh, uh, since the trade war began, uh, the uh, dollar yuan has uh, risen by close to 10% and gold has fallen by um, a similar amount from 1369 down to 1200, actually a little more than that. So the, the correlation is obvious. And if you actually, Ole Hansen had a great chart on this on Twitter recently. If you just look at the chart, you can see it moves tick for tick. Um, as I, my response to people who doubt this is until I see the golden one terms break 8360 or 8200 on the downside, it's simple math that the dollar one is inversely, the dollar one is literally driving the gold price on an inverse basis. If it goes up, gold goes down. If dollar one goes down, gold goes up. Simple as that. And I'll attach a link to your article so our listeners can look at that and look through the argument that you've made. I've heard other people in the gold community, I guess maybe you were the first one that came out with this and other people were talking about it. Not sure if they credited you for this, but you know, I think the gold market is not a free market. I mean, I've learned that kind of the hard way. I follow GATA's work, the Gold Antitrust Action Committee. I think there's a lot of people who don't want the gold price going higher. Uh, you know, uh, Some people think that China wants a higher gold price, but I'm not so sure about that. And I think you laid the argument uh, out for you know why China doesn't want a high gold price, at least in their own currency. And then maybe also China is accumulating a lot of gold. So we don't know, things are not very transparent in China. We know that the private sector of Chinese, there is a lot of gold imports. We don't know the exact numbers of what the Chinese government's doing for their gold purchases though. Well, China may, China and Russia may want a higher gold price, but like anyone who wants to uh, have a higher valuation for an asset, be it stocks, bonds, uh, a house, you want to buy it when it's cheap. And you, what's currently going on in the gold market uh, enables China to pick up gold on the cheap, uh, if you will, uh, around $1,200. And uh, that does not necessarily mean that they don't want it to go higher. What I would say is, why does China want, why, is it, why are they loading up on gold? Why is Russia doing it? 
I believe they are hedging against a crash in the US dollar. Uh, that's my expectation, which uh, is another reason why I say dollar strength is only accelerating its own demise. It's only accelerating the de-dollarization process around the world. And uh, that's what China and Russia are doing. So this may be a floor in uh, gold. I, I think if uh, China responds to um, 25% tariffs on uh, Chinese exports in September, we could go a little lower, but it, we're close to a low in gold and then we're going to go higher. That's my view. And from uh, we were talking about this before we started recording. I look at the supply side of gold from the mining standpoint. So I'm bottom up more in the gold market and I kind of can tell you what the miners margins are. And the gold miners had and silver miners had better margins in Q1 because the oil prices weren't as high. The metals prices were high. So basically a large component of mining is the oil price or diesel. And if the metals prices are pretty high and the oil price is not, you can probably have a good margin unless it's a very inefficient miner and there's problems running the mining company in the operation. But you know, now the last couple quarters, the numbers for the Q2 numbers for the gold miners were very disappointing, even though the oil price was not as high as it is now. And the miners did, uh, especially the larger miners, the larger miners are claiming to have these low all-in sustaining costs, some of them between like $600 and $900 an ounce. So they should have enormous margins still, and they, they just don't because we're at a 12 10 gold price in U.S. dollars uh, approximately right now, $15.27 in silver. And, you know, I think right now we're almost around the cost of production. For, for a good amount of the primary gold and silver miners. So like basically, David, I think for seven years now, now some people think that gold's in a stealth bull market. I don't, I think gold since 2015 has had, it had a bear market rally, a very strong one. And either gold is uh, the breakout, the restart of the bull market has either not been confirmed because gold didn't hold a certain support level, silver didn't hold a certain support level. So either we've been going sideways in a range bound market that's not bull or not bear, but you know, the miners for seven years, the miners, at least the supply side of that argument for gold and silver, the miners have been in a bear market, in my opinion, for seven years. And so they've been in cost cutting mode. There's not capital available. Like if you if you went back and looked at the financial numbers, the cost cuts, all the stuff, it's been very, very tough for the mining industry. So, um, you know, I don't know how much lower the prices can go without some of the miners making very difficult decisions about whether or not to shut down a mine, to sell the company to someone else. We're basically at that point because there's really not a lot of capital available for the miners anymore. Yeah, I, I agree completely. And uh, you, you can't keep selling a product below the cost of production for very long because then production shuts down. So I, I agree wholeheartedly. I don't think gold is going much lower, but I do think, I don't believe we've seen the low. So could we see uh, 1170, 1150, 1124 again? Briefly, yeah. Briefly. I think, it would, I think it would be briefly. If it stayed there for a couple quarters, like I said, the miners would be making, some of them, the higher cost ones, would have to make some very, very tough decisions. Yeah, and, and like my analysis, like when I say I use a holistic approach with regard to my views with regard to uh, a crash in stocks or a bottom in gold, you can also look at these factors and they all have to marry well together in order to be credible. You can't say uh, there's going to be a crash in uh, stocks and then say gold is going to go down the toilet. Well, because it, it wouldn't make sense. The crash in stocks is going to fa force the Fed to reverse course. It has to. And I wanted to talk about this before we got onto gold. And I, I, you know, I, I talked too much about all the reasons for the crash, but this is a key one I want to talk about. Um, I saw this myself in the uh, uh, last year, late last year in uh, August, September, that when the Fed was planning to do QT, that when the dollar was getting weaker in 2017, uh, I noticed bond deals were going higher. And then they started pursuing QT and they were, um, at each auction, I noticed that the uh, yields were going higher. And obviously the Fed and the authorities noticed because uh, every time an auction came around after that, you just saw the dollar go up uh, right before the auction and then it went down again. Uh, but then bond yields continued higher. Um, and what obviously they realized was that if you know, who wants to buy a U.S. Treasury bond, especially foreigners, foreign uh, central banks, if the dollar is going to go south? I mean, you might get a nice yield relative to the rest of the world, but if the dollar is going south relative to your currency, whatever gain you're getting on the interest is getting eaten up by the loss in the FX. So I noticed that the they started pursuing a strong dollar policy around the, you know, the turn of the year, especially February when the stock market had its wobble, that 
uh, ensured that they kept bond yields down, especially once bond yields went above 3%. They got to 312 and now they've never gotten there since they got to 3% there recently, and they're trying to hold that. Well, the strong dollar is enabling that. Well, Luke Roman and uh, another fellow Irishman, Louis Curran, did a great analysis on this, um, where they pointed out that the Fed has three priorities. The stock uh, Number one is the bond market, because if bond yields go higher, that brings down all risk assets and uh, blows up the U.S. budget uh, deficit. Um, because the interest uh, cost of all that debt goes through the roof. Number two is stocks. So, uh, the capital gains uh, taxes that they make on um, stock appreciation, stock market appreciation, the IRA distributions, etc. That is a huge factor to federal tax receipts. Uh, and that co should come as no surprise because the stock market is now 150% of GDP. So number two is the stock market. Number three is the dollar. So if they have these three factors that the Fed is focused on, well, they need to maintain a strong dollar to keep bond deals down. They figured that out at the start of the year, and that's what they're doing. But the problem is it's putting pressure on the rest of the world, as you're seeing in emerging markets. Um, and it's also putting pressure on the stock market directly because a lot of multinationals, including Apple, they sell products abroad. Well, if the dollar value of foreign earnings drops as the dollar goes up. So that impairs their earnings. Yep. And so... Point being is if we get a crash, uh, I went through all the factors earlier, why I expect that uh, there's a high likelihood of crash in stocks in September or October. If we do get a crash, then the Fed has a decision to make. You've got bonds, stocks, and the dollar. You're propping up bonds to keep yields down, and you're propping up dollar to keep also keep yields down. Um, now the stock market crashes, what do you do? Well, you're going to have to return to QE to buy all those bonds to keep the yields down and also to pump up the stock market because you need to keep those yields down for the reasons I mentioned, the keep the risk-free rate low. You need to keep stock market going up because otherwise you blow up the, 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 the U.S. budget deficit and uh, uh, the federal tax receipts. So what do you sacrifice? You're going to have to sacrifice the dollar. And... And it sounds like China, sorry to interrupt you, it sounds like China, the European Central Bank, Japan, they all want to take turns maybe devaluing their currency like that. So it sounds like not just the U.S. wants to, to devalue the dollar. It sounds like all these guys want to, maybe maybe they're coordinating. We, we don't know. There's no transparency here. Maybe they're taking turns. But I think I think I, I really agree with this rationale here that they can't do all three. So they can do well, they maybe can. two at they, you can't do all three. It's just not rational, not mathematical. You can manipulate markets as much as you want, but they still can't do all three. Like you said, the three scenarios, they can only do two out of the three. And it seems the one they're preferring is, okay, we have weaker, a oh, weaker currency, not collapsing currency, but weaker currency, and that'll allow us to save our bond market and keep the stock market from crashing them. And that's what Trump wants. That's what Trump wants is, uh, uh, like, think about it. If we, if we get a crash, that, that provides the excuse that the Fed needs to revert to QE, to reverse policy, to stop hiking rates and start cutting them again, to reverse policy, stop the QT program, uh, go back to QE, and in the process, what happens to the dollar? That's the only thing propping up the dollar is divergent monetary policies. It goes south. And, and every and if I could add as an Austrian school free market economist, every single major country wants uh, economists who's man who's giving like advice for trade policy, monetary policy wants that as well. No one wants a strong currency. Everyone has Keynesian economics is a derivative from mercantilism. Everyone wants a weaker controlled devaluation currency to boost exports. Trump wants that. So pretty much does everyone else. China wants that, too. So this yeah. is the new normal. We have everyone trying to do mercantilist policies. And this, I think, ultimately, David, best case scenario for me, in my opinion, is this is going to flood with the trade war escalating in the U.S. and China. This is going to put a lot more higher inflationary costs in the global supply chain, the trade wars, the tariffs. That's going to put higher costs in the global supply chain. Um, you know, pe the, uh, wage increases in the U.S., that's going to put higher costs in the supply chain. So I see stag um, – I can make an argument that we already have stagflation here in the U.S., but I, th I think in the f near future it's probably going to get worse, and that's a best case scenario for me. And, and I agree totally with that. If actually you ask some of the followers who have been with me since I started being active on Twitter in January of 2017, I, I've been saying that since day one, that that's what I see. And uh, what's the best environment? What asset performs the best in a stagflationary environment? Gold uh, and silver. Pro 
probably gold. And if you have rental properties locked in at, you know, in a pretty good area, locked in at a fixed interest rate, then um, your mortgage is going to get devalued. So you're going to get the cash flow from the rental properties to pay off your mortgage and buy something else with. Yeah. So gold and silver and maybe some some rental properties or something. That's just my opinion, not financial advice. But Absolutely. And, and, and I would add, uh, I just bought uh, some farmland and uh, property on it uh, back in February of last year for that very reason. You know, uh, farmland will appreciate because not only is it land, but you can produce stuff on it. So um, prices are probably going up too. Absolutely. Look, when this, I, I've said to some guys, and this is my opinion, it may not happen. The crash may not happen. But if it does, uh, the Fed will likely reverse course. The dollar is likely going to fall. Then commodities, which have been hammered since 2011, I'm talking about the wheat and soybeans and uh, coffee, sugar, cotton, live cattle, hogs, you name it, they're going to skyrocket. And uh, gold and silver, obviously, too. I don't call them commodities. They're money, in my opinion, but that's a whole other discussion. But uh, I want to go back to something you said earlier in our conversation where you said, uh, I, I mentioned that I don't believe uh, in w what these dollar bulls are thinking when they say, like, potentially $120 index. Going back to the one, two, three discussion, they have to sacrifice the dollar because if it, it doesn't, you can't have a strong stock market in the US with the dollar at, say, uh, uh, over 100, 110, 105, 110. Don't even have to go to 120. Because look at the problems that we're facing in the world today with the dollar just at 96. What do you think happens to emerging markets around the world? What do you think happens to U.S. banks with loans to all these countries? I mean, what happens to the worldwide tequila growth? Crisis. Yes, tequila I mean, crisis. we've, we've Asian, had... So the Asian tiger crisis and the tequila crisis, for our listeners not familiar, right? It started in a small country or with a bank that wasn't too big and it spread... Uh, a lot quickly, a lot more quickly into a lot larger players than anyone thought, right? And then people needed bailouts. Exactly. I mean, all more people need to go back and look at history, and because history tends to repeat itself, because we all suffer from sh uh, short-term memory loss, it seems. Um, we forget recency bias too. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. We we forget what has happened, and we've had plenty examples of this, and. And we're never seeing it now. You've got examples. It's Brazil, Argentina, Turkey. Who's next? You, this is not going to stop. And the, the further the dollar goes north, the, the bigger the impact to these countries. And the, eventually that contagion in an interconnected world is going to filter through to the U.S. And the U.S. stock market is going to fall. So the dollar will be sacrificed. Now, you're right. They, they will pass the parcel as well, pass the parcel as well in terms of uh, currency devaluation. But the dollar must fall because it's the global reserve currency. It's not like the yen going down against the Brazilian real. This is the global reserve currency. It affects everybody. It needs to drop in order for everybody to, to benefit, not the U.S. included. So I see the Fed uh, focusing on keeping bond yields down, propping up the stock market. And what enables them to do that is a stock market crash. They can revert to QE prop up bonds, prop up stocks, but they'll and they can sacrifice the dollar, which freezes the president of the United States as well. Everybody's happy. So when people ask me, well, why would they do this? Uh, well, aren't the reasons obvious? And I will also say that it's easier to stimulate a stock market that's 30, 40% off than it is at one that's at all time highs. I want to thank you again for your work today, David. You've, I think you've given our listeners some great analysis here. They're probably going to want to go back and listen to it at least maybe once or twice. And uh, how do our listeners find your work? Oh, you can just look me up on Twitter. My handle is at Global Pro Trader, no S. And I've got a website that's GlobalProTraders.com. Uh, there's no fee. It's free. Uh, it's just where we go in there. We It's a forum for us to share our views and opinions on what's happening. And anybody can join. All you need is an email address. There's no spam, nothing, no credit cards. Anybody's welcome to join. Um, so, yeah. That's the best way to reach me if anybody has got any uh, any uh, comments you want to share or any questions for me. Great. And I'll attach links to your most recent Sprott Money articles, too, because there's some very interesting analysis in there as well, including the case that you lay out, how China basically has open market operations, uh, keeping their gold price in RMB in a range. So thank you again for your time. And uh, hopefully, if you're willing to come back on for an interview in the near future, we'll have you back on. Thanks so much, Jason. Appreciate it. Please like this video. Share it with friends and family, and don't forget to subscribe to the Wall Street for Main Street YouTube channel if you have not already done so.
Thanks for helping Wall Street for Main Street pass the 20,000 YouTube channel subscriber milestone despite YouTube censorship. Hopefully, we'll be able to get to 30,000 or even 40,000 YouTube channel subscribers quickly if YouTube doesn't shut down this channel. If YouTube does shut down this channel, remember to also sign up for the Wall Street for Main Street email list that's on the wallstreetformainstreet.com website and will tell you where the videos are going to be uploaded instead of YouTube. Also, if you really like the content and you decide that you want to give a one-time donation, you can go to the wallstreetformainstreet.com website where there's different options for you to do so. Or you can become a Patreon contributor. Thanks for listening, and I look forward to providing my loyal listeners with some of the best information, analysis, and financial education available out there, free or paid, as I work to grow the podcast and also get my educational technology company funded.